for product design. I've been working in product design my entire career and started designing when I was 15. So it's been a, a long journey, a lifelong passion that truly has brought joy to my life in many areas. So when we look around us, everything that we see that wasn't created by nature was be cre created by a designer like one of us. So I'm happy to bring you all into that world. Uh, I've worked for companies like Disney World, NCR, Flatiron. So just love making things and love teaching. Thanks, Ashley. And my name is Joshua Robinson, and I'm the director of the product design program. Uh, here at Flatiron School. So I work on uh, the curriculum and the programming and assessments and labs and Figma files and all of the things that uh, the Flatiron students get into day after day. So um, again, thrilled that you all are joining us for uh, our first episode of this brand new series. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to show you some of my thinking around these ideas about rhythm and scale. Now, what you will be able to see is a Q&A function uh, down at the bottom of your screen. And you can just click that. And at any point, if you want to ask a question or uh, make a comment, you just go ahead and do it. Ashley and I will keep an eye on that Q&A. This is going to be fairly interactive and informal where we will go back and forth uh, and answer your questions, take your ideas, uh, and in general, just hear what you're thinking about the themes that we're talking about. So please use the chat or use the Q&A if you want to ask a question. You don't need to wait till the end. You can do it while we're going through all of this. Again, this is like a big family, a big community. So it's informal. We want to hear from you. We want to know uh, if you have ideas or thoughts or questions about what we're doing, okay? All right, so let's dive in here. So I'm using a program called Figma and we use Figma in our product design program. In fact, all of our lectures, all of our assessments and labs, we're all in Figma with the students, the instructors and the students all day long, right? So it's a program that we find very useful for uh, collaborative design. And what you're gonna see is that Ashley Kays is in here with me. So Ashley, we go ahead and move your cursor around up here and say hello. Yes, sorry, I was, there we go. Let me see which screen you're on, where you are. There you are. Do you see me? <laughs> All right, so cool. So Ashley and I can do a little uh, cursor dance there. But um, again, this is like a virtual whiteboard where we can collaborate with as many people as we want uh, and we can design together. We can do code design. So thank you for saying hello, Ashley. Um, and we're going to just use this space as, again, a virtual whiteboard. We're going to collaborate in it. Once I get through talking through some of these themes, then you all are going to help Ashley and I create a new design based on the topics that we've just talked about. So you're going to help us kind of come up with an idea for a product. And we're going to try to use these principles uh, and talk back and forth and solve some of the problems that come up along the way. OK. Yeah. Can you spell Figma? You spelled Figma just fine, F-I-G-M-A. So you got it exactly right. Thank you, Edward. All right, so I can zoom in here and rather than doing the slide deck presentation, uh, what I'm going to do is kind of just move back around uh, throughout the board so it feels a little bit more organic, a bit more like a space that we're all in together. So the first thing I want to do is I want to hide the UI. There, that clears it up a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about rhythm and scales. What do I mean when I say rhythm? What does rhythm have to do with user interface design? Well, we can think about rhythm as a pattern, right? Something that repeats. Now, if you have something that just repeats over and over and over with no variation, that can be quite boring, right? Now, 
Some of you may like electronic dance music, four on the floor, right? Just the constant doom, 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 like, and there's not a lot of variation, right? Or at least there's not variation in the, uh, in the kick drum, right? The kick drum is like that steady, steady beat underneath everything. But there's all this other variation that happens throughout the composition, right? There's the build, there's the drop, right? There's the anticipation and the expectation that the dance music brings. So even though you have repetition or you have patterns, you have another thing that's very important for interest, and that is called contrast. You have to be able to feel, hear, or see the difference between things to be able to make sense of a composition, whether a song or a user interface design. Now, you can think about contrast in two different ways. You can think about rapid contrast, meaning going from one state, you could call this right here, state A. I'll just type in an A. You could call this state B. I'm gonna bump you in front, right? So you move from one state to the next quite rapidly. There's a big change, big contrast. Just like these two colors could be color A and color B, and you've got a big contrast between both of them. Or you could have low contrast, which might mean you have gradual or slow movement, right? Meaning there's not as much dynamic between the steps, right? And what that might look like in user interface design is a gradient. So rather than a rapid color change from one to another, you have a gradual shift along the color spectrum from one to the next. It creates a nicer, softer, slower movement. Now, there is not a worse or better one of these. You need both in user interface design. You need to know when to use them. Another way you could think about it is almost like frames per second. So how many of you are familiar with, um, with anime or just animation in general? Like Ashley worked for Disney, so <laughs> you're very familiar with animation, obviously. And Disney, of course, set the standard for a lot of animation. So Catherine, you're very familiar with anime. Now, what's I, what I learned in my research, um, and, and I do like to watch a little bit of anime, is that most animation characters are not animated at the full 24 frames per second. They're actually animated at 12, 8, or 6 frames per second, which is called animating on the 2s, 3s, or 4s. And this allows the user's attention to be on the painted background in scenes where there's not a lot of rapid action so you get this style of exaggerated movement. So if, if any of you kind of know what that like animation, anime style is, it's because of the drops in frames per second. So what that means is that the animation keyframes might be more like this. You might have only six to eight changes within a second, whereas in uh, typical animation like Disney or Pixar or something like that, you have a lot more frames per second, which makes it more smooth, right? So if some of you have like the really nice 120 kilohertz uh, TVs that are out these days, and you know that like frame smoothing that happens that makes everything look very buttery smooth on the TV, it's because it's packing more frames into uh, a smaller time space. So Again, that's a way of creating contrast. You have quick jumps versus smooth jumps, whether it's a gradient or whether it's an anime. Again, it's all about what you're trying to accomplish. Now let's talk about scale. You can think about scale like the volume that you're speaking in. Or you can think about it like music notes. If I'm a really good storyteller, if I'm good at drawing you in, I can change the volume or the cadence 
and I can try to hook you and bring you in, right? And then with the really important part, I might get louder and try to overemphasize and really create that contrast and bam, you're right with me, right? But that back and forth, that variance creates interest. It's almost like our little human brains can't help but be drawn in and hooked when there's contrast, okay? And you see this in uh, measurements too. So amplitude, right? Amplitude waves. Lower amplitudes are going to be softer sounds, right? It doesn't go as high on the amplitude scale. But the louder sounds where the big, big, big loud, that's the sound waves go much higher and lower, creating contrast, okay? Now, another way to think about scales is in musical composition. So, quick test for all you musicians out there. What scale is this? You can answer it in the chat. Who knows what scale this is? Hmm, I saw somebody got it. Let's see. Yeah, Jaina or Jana, you got it first. Chromatic and Lark right behind you. It's the chromatic scale. Obviously, there is a larger jump between middle C that starts out right here. Switch over to my pen tool or pencil tool. Can't remember the shortcut. Okay, here we go. There is a larger jump from middle C to this, what's called a fourth, which is F. This is C. It's over here. There's a larger jump from here than, say, the semitone, is this a, or half, half step from middle C to C sharp, right? So this is a much smaller step. Mm, this is a much bigger step. Mm, another way to say that is there is a larger amount of contrast between C and F than there is C and C sharp, right? That just makes logical sense. Just like there is more contrast between a quick color shift here and a gradual color change here, okay? Makes logical sense. Now, what about UI design? In UI design, we use scales as well. We use typographic scales or pixel scales. And you can see here, we have a four pixel scale. So we add four pixels for every, every one of these, and then you start getting larger and larger. So the scale increases. And you can say there is a larger contrast between four pixels and 192 pixels, there's a bigger jump than between four pixels and 12 pixels. Again, it's just logic. But how does that translate to user interface design? Well, let's think about user interface elements. If I have one element that is this size, Let's just say it's 12 by 12. I'm going to use this scale, even though it's not accurate. And then I have an object that is this size, so 768 pixels by 768 pixels. That is a massive jump between elements in scale. So when I'm looking at my visual design, it probably doesn't make sense to have an object that is very small and then all of a sudden a massive object. What I really probably want in my UI design is a gradual step, okay, of objects between. I want objects, depending on how important they are, I want these different size objects, right? and they all sit there together. So what does that look like practically, okay? Well, here you go. So this is, again, this is using a 12 point or eight point or four point scale. It's, it's all the same, divisible by four, divisible by two, 
right? And you see how they have an object that is quite large over here, a medium-sized object here that is on the same scale, and then here they probably have a, you know, a larger headline object. And then a small, even, even smaller object here, and then a smaller object here. So levels of scale create visual interest. This is an interesting composition. It's an interesting layout because there are levels of scale. It's not just big, 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 tiny, tiny, tiny. You've got that gradual smoothness to it. And this is a very simple, very, very simple example. Okay. Making sure we don't have any more questions. Okay, good. Moving on. What about rhythm? Rhythm and scale. If scale creates visual interest, rhythm keeps you looking at the composition. It keeps your eye moving, right? Just like the beat of the bass drum. You might repeat some design elements or certain design characteristics may repeat to create that sense of rhythm or a sense of direction if you're trying to lead the eye from left to right or top to bottom. So you might use something, a visual principle called similarity. And this makes the composition compelling because your brain and your eye, you're reminded of what you saw before. This is a Danish artist, a graphic designer and product designer from uh, 20s and 30s. Um, I, his name fails me. Let's see, Enzo Mari. Okay, Dutch, not, yeah, he was a Dutch designer created these really interesting compositions by using repetition, create these really interesting rhythms where things aren't exactly the same, right? It's not exactly the same. There are subtle shifts and changes and variations in the design that create interest, but they're just similar enough. There's similarity between all of the different elements and it creates a composition that works together. And you see this in art too, similarity in this painting, right? You see where you've got the same arc happening in the umbrellas of every, uh, every person in the painting holding the umbrellas, the hats, the dog's tail, the curve of the dress. It's repetition. It creates this rhythm and similarity that calls back to other pieces and it brings it all together into a nice, cohesive composition. In modern UI design, you're seeing a lot of the same thing where you have similar shapes, right? If you use a radius here in the play button, so I can make a play button and look about the same. If I apply a radius, you can see I can make it curve like that. Not quite that drastic. And you can see that down here, they've got the same curve going on. All right. They've also got curves happening here in the search box. It's a little hard to see but the search box doesn't have completely hard edges like that. It's got a little bit of a radius to just soften the form field. Trying to see if there's anywhere else in here that they might be using the curves. Yeah, down here on the button right there, normal, it has a little radius that curves, certainly here. There's no square, no hard edges. These are all, these all have a radius applied to it. So it's these little subtle touches that just make it all work together, right? There's other things too in the typography. If you look at the type style here for, let me go back to my pen tool. If you look at the title, artist, my collection, 
my playlist time these all have the same style because it tells my mind when i look at this interface that these have similar meanings right it is the title of a group of objects in this case the title of um, the songs or the title of the artist or the title of the timestamp the title of the collection of the group of icons and menu items over here and my, the title of my playlists okay so using similarity and repetition creates rhythm and here's another great example this is just plain old boring documentation on the web okay there's, there's nothing particularly interesting about it but they've done a great job of creating rhythm using similarity so what you have is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, right? The beat of the bass drum. And then they make them just different enough that it's still interesting. Again, if you just had the same thing over and over and over, it's not going to be that interesting. But they've used these nice icons. They're the same color palette. They're really just two colors. Three colors if you include the white. Um, and that makes it just interesting enough that I'm, I can scan quickly and see that these are, in fact, different things. But they're all the same category of what's new in Tailwind. Same thing here, right? Same, 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 same but different, same but different, same but different, right? You've got these chunks of information all together. It's all logical. It all has nice rhythm and good scale. All right. Ashley, thank you. What do you give us? What you give us your thoughts here on the rhythm of shape? I'm, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> sorry. You okay. can't tell I do this every day. Um, actually, I was just including this to support what you were saying about the rhythm in general, that rhythm can be represented in shapes, in colors, in tents, and tones. And I actually added some more information uh, near the bottom of where we are in this episode. Um, so for example, um, just a couple of things that I was reading to support this is that rhythm is so powerful that it can literally hypnotize repetition of words or images can affect our mental and emotional state which sounds pretty powerful uh, memory and thinking in fact it really almost rules our brain so good design that's why it's important not to use dark patterns which you'll learn about in our classes <laughs> but good design is just like your favorite song it has rhythm and many think rhythm is only about the picture but that's really just a minor part of its potential and then this is just represent representative of using shape and then there's some other examples down below of color and tint and shading lines to support what you were sharing awesome this is a great example because um you have these again the repetition of this but what you also see is what i just talked about is scale they're not all the same size. It creates variance. Here, I'll make these different, slightly different opacities so we can still see everything. Okay. If you keep, oops, keep going, you can see a larger circle right there, right? And maybe even others. I'm, my eye kind of like moves around a lot, but it's a perfect example of levels of scale but also rhythm and, and repetition. And you said there were some other examples, right? Uh, the near the bottom, or actually right below your, your area. Okay. The Down here? Mm-hmm. Great. Oh, Adidas. The... Yeah. Tell, talk, talk about this example. Um, well, you know, we have uh, the same shape, but different scale. So we have the rhythm of this regular repetition in terms of the shape appearing, but we're also using scale proportion to represent what's ultimately meant to represent a shoe, I believe. But mm -hmm. 
that's how they're using a simple shape to convey meaning. Yeah, repetition in the uh, negative, what are these called, bowls or typography? I can't remember, <laughs> right? Yeah. You've got mm -hmm. these same shapes repeated over and over in the typography, little donuts happening. And the mm -hmm. S is similarly shaped. Increased cohesion. It's meant to be together. That's, that's, that's what distinguishes a really good design. It's almost like it was meant to be, right? Cool. Oh, rhythm of color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, and it, the fact that like the tone is the same, right? Like it's two different colors, but it still is like the same darker tone of each one. There's three different ones. There's a tone here. There's a tone here. And then there's the main tone here. And even though it's different colors on each one, the, the values are very close in terms of like brightness, right? So it creates this like thing, like they're, they're meant to be in the same. Family. Family, yeah. Oh, stop, man, you pulled some such good examples. <laughs> I just wanna draw over all of these all day long. Like the curves, <laughs> the similarity in the, yeah, that's cool. I like this one. Yeah, there's something about that one. Plus summer just goes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Awesome. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, so I got through those. The last thing I just wanted to say is like, you have to pull these things together for great design. It's all about how the elements are arranged and how those elements have relationships to each other. So simple way to say it is good composition, which is gonna have good rhythm. It's gonna have good scales. It's going to attract the eye it's going to guide the eye, just like a good, what is this? This is a graffe fugue. Sorry if I mispronounced that. But just like a great musical composition brings us on that journey, right? So we have visual rhythm and scales that help us guide, be guided through the visual composition and help us interpret what we're supposed to do. At the end of the day, most of the UI design things that we make are not just supposed to be pleasant to look at, although that's a benefit, right? As aesthetic usability effect, that's a real thing. Um, but ultimately we want to work in the software. We, want, we have a goal or we have tasks that we need to accomplish. So we have to interpret what the interface means. And we have all of these things at our disposal right, as UI designers to create these different things that make it easier to do what we need to do or to find the information that we're searching for in the documentation. So I, I love these two examples from architecture and from this 16th century mosque because it's such great examples of how these principles have been around since the dawn of everything because you find it in nature too that's the one thing i didn't really pull from but you find it levels of scale you find rhythm and uh in nature as well but if you look at this you can see the repetition right down here again one two three this one's in six eight pattern i guess or six <laughs> six eight time signature because you've got six across the bottom, right? And then you got up here, repeating these scales. Even down here, you can't really see the whole thing in the shrine, but again, you've got this repetition of very similar shapes, but they are slightly different, right? And even the beautiful curve and swoop of this just feels like it belongs. It's a really lovely example. Same thing here on the uh, mosque tiles. You've got this space, these spaces, which are very similar, but not exactly the same. So it creates really good interest in these four uh, negative spaces here, but they're not really negative because they all have similar shapes going on in the very inside of them. Again, levels of scale. 
similar shape, different level of scale going on. It's repeated over and over and over, but in slightly varying ways. Okay, I've talked a lot and haven't really done a lot of work, so that's pretty typical for me. Uh, aesthetic usability effect. Thank you, Lark. Aesthetic usability effect is the idea that a product is more usable when it is aesthetically pleasing or when it matches the uh, mental models that we have, when it matches like the human uh, understanding of things like visual composition. In fact, if you go to, oh, that's a great question, Alexia. Ashley, can you maybe look for some examples of bad designs, the negative, uh, mm -hmm. that don't have rhythm and scale? While sure, I, sure. Thank you so much. I want to show Lark where you can find some really good information about these different. I believe the website is called Laws of UX, which is using human psychology. Uh-huh, oh, and the, well, how about that, it's the first one. So the aesthetic usability effect. Users perceive aesthetically pleasing designs as designs that is more usable. Uh, whether that is necessarily true, we perceive it to be more usable because it's pleasant to look at. So if you really, really like the way a particular piece of software looks, even if it is less, even if it takes you longer to do the same thing, you might choose that software because of the aesthetic usability effect. Prime example, I think Spotify probably has a more usable user interface or, you, or app, but I actually prefer Tidal for its aesthetic. As the designer in me, I just like to look at Tidal more. I like to be in that software more. Even though, I'll be completely honest, like making playlists and working in the interface, trying to do a lot, it's more frustrating to me than it is to do in Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. But I just like the way it looks, so I'm willing to forgive. That is the aesthetic usability effect. I bet, I bet all of you, if you really think about it, could probably come up with lots of examples of you're just like, I like this program, I like this app, um, even though maybe it doesn't have like the most usable interface. Great question. Okay. Ashley, did you have any? Uh, yes, I, paste, I placed one on the board near the, um, I think the temple, kind of near where you're, I'm moving it up near you. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's some, I'm working on more, but right. poor rhythm here. Yeah, so the color is very, uh, Oops. very good example of good and bad rhythm. Um, the good, obviously the similarity effect of the, um, of the circles being the same color, being the same shape. The eye wants to group the green circles together, it's almost like we see those green circles as being the same thing because they're the same shape, same color. And we see the blue circles being the same thing, the same shape and the same color, even though they are separated, right? That's gestalt, that, that's human psychology. That, that is just the visual cognitive thing that we all as humans have going on where we want these blues to mean the same thing and we want the greens to mean the same thing even though they are further apart in space. Yeah, obviously this is a, you know, kind of low-hanging fruit, bad example um, of there's no meaning, there's no, <laughs> or, there's no order, right? There's just, there's no reason behind the choices that are made here. Um, yeah, all right. On that note, I, I did find another just funny one, unrelated, but I'm just gonna paste it because it was silly. Here we go. Great. Bad design in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for humor. Yep. <laughs> oh boy, that's 
That's good. All right. Uh, Melissa asks, are there UX drawbacks when the UI is overly uniform? Um, Ashley, do you want to take that one? I think so. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind, and Joshua might have others. But one thing is that we can become blind to something when we see the same thing over and over. It's almost like because there's no differentiation, everything's bold. If you, if you if everything is set to bold, then nothing is technically important or different. Another thing that can happen is it can seem too commercial or maybe unnatural, you could say, mm -hmm. and um, people might assume like, oh, this isn't this isn't relatable to me. This is this is too perfect, too commercial. I'm moving on to the next thing that feels more relative. That's just um, a couple of ideas that come to mind. Yeah, to carry that into um, back to the music and composition realm, um, a lot of novice musicians use uh, software like Ableton Live or Reason or um, you know, software that allows them to create electronic music. And novices almost always do not know how to create interesting variation in their composition. So you do hear like very static, very uninteresting. It's that robot effect, right? Where it's, it's obviously created by a computer it doesn't sound human or organic or natural. And it's the same thing with visual UI design where it just doesn't look like it's had a human touch because humans were imperfect. It's actually, I'm sure if there are any Ableton Live users or electronic music users in our audience today, you're laughing at me and saying, what a fool. Um, but musicians will actually create rhythms that are slightly off perfect beat. And the reason they do that is because we humans, when we go into the recording studio and play drums or whatever, we never play it perfectly on beat. So to hear something that is so quantized over and over and over feels, <laughs> feels unnatural. That is why we will swing You'll hear swing and jazz and music, right? They will swing the rhythm just slightly off beat to make it more interesting. So if they're mus electronic musicians are not the only ones who do that to make it more interesting. I'm sure if we have any uh, musicians in the audience, you can you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Creating interesting variants and dynamics. Uh, and yes, when everything is bold, nothing is bold. <laughs> awesome. Okay, why don't we jump into doing a little bit of design, Ashley? Um, again, I could talk on and on and on about all of these great examples, and I feel like we're getting such interesting questions. Thank you. What I want to ask our audience right now, though, is to give us an idea for an app. What is something that we could quickly design in like 15 minutes? So nothing to do with like cryptocurrency or anything to... <laughs> too wild you know give us something nice what is an app idea that you all have where ashley and i could start to create an interface and we're going to try to use some interesting rhythm and scale to do that or maybe it's a we'll do the marketing website for your idea i don't know we'll see just want to see what ideas you have i just want to point out something if you don't mind um I usually, um, Josh and I, we would start with sketching your ideas. So whatever you come up with, the first step in a great design process is sketching it out so that we don't get too far down the line before we realize what's technically feasible or not. So depending on what you present to us, you know, we may need to think through and sketch out a few ideas and run them by you guys. Yeah, feel free to sketch. I'm going to grab this idea right here. I that just, I really think is interesting. Um, oh, there's so many interesting ideas. I want to do them all. <laughs> but I saw sad. one that was really cool that said, um, pick a dog collar. Let's see. Huh. Oh, they're making it too easy for us. I can already think of the, the rhythm there. <laughs> pick a dog collar and leash combo. I'm thinking of a cool micro interaction there too, where they could customize the color and the, the settings and we could have an interactive picker. 
sounding fun. Yeah. That's a cool idea. Okay, I'm going to pull up my UI interface here and just start getting some ideas. Ashley, feel free if you want to sketch some things and then come in and First. put yep. ideas. But I'm thinking what you want to start out with is probably inputting or being able to search for some information. Um, depending on what kind of dog you have. So there's some parameters that we want to think about, like dog size. I'm not a dog owner, so I bet there's lots of like good things that you could think about. Um, dog size, I guess breed. What else? Coat color. going to put a stroke around the outside of this. Okay. And the first thing I'm going to do is also going to have like a placeholder right now for like a logo which kind of creates some nice visual interest in this upper corner okay turn off pixel preview because that's making everything kind of pixelated and what i'm thinking is at the top i might show some examples of dog collars and dog leashes that are paired with dogs, almost like some examples. Now, knowing some pet owners like I know them, I know that like I want to make the dog the most a more like dominant thing in this list of examples. So I'm just gonna see what I get when I I'm gonna use a plugin in Figma called Unsplash that just lets me search for pictures that I can use as a placeholder. <laughs> See, I just want the collar. I like the idea of using a radius because it softens the image a little bit, right? It doesn't make it quite so intense, those edges. So I'm gonna apply a radius there. Okay. And I'm also going to drop the word dog just to make it simpler. And I'm going to reduce the text size, make it a nicer color, less intense, I think. Make it semi-bold. And I'm going to put a little character spacing in it to make it a little more readable. First thing I want to do now I've got to explain what this is so I'm gonna need a dominant element or title up here um, that might say something like here are some product pairings from proud dog owners and I'm gonna make this pretty big
super, super dominant and bold, way too dominant and bold. So I'm gonna back that style off and make it just maybe light, okay? I'm gonna have it, when everything's bold, nothing's bold. So I don't, I don't want everything to be so huge. I can back off the size there. Okay. Another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap this around, I think, and have the dog be here on the left because the eye always searches in that F-shaped pattern, right? We scan across, so we're very first thing you read are gonna be this headline, which is great. And then you're gonna start scanning back over down the bar of the F. So the next thing that I want you to see is this like beautiful golden retriever, if that is indeed what it is. And you're gonna scan over and see what collar and leash paired with the golden retriever. Now let's get our spacing a little better. So it looks like they belong together. Oh, and you know what else? This is what I'm gonna to do to create some interest. I'm gonna put the dog's name here, because again, it's about being personal, about making it about the pet. Sorry, so generic. All right, and then here, we're gonna have a description of the pet, something about the pet, maybe that the pet owner submitted. And that's gonna be in a smaller size. Like, like that, okay, and I'm gonna use a plugin that will fill this with just placeholder text for me. Just so I don't have to worry about, this is called lorem ipsum. And I can auto-generate the perfect amount of text to fit within that thing. So boom, there you go. So this is going to be about Fido. Okay, it's going to be close to the picture, so it's related. Over here, we might have the little space. Okay. And then I can repeat this right, for different pets. Make this a little bigger. Now, I don't need to repeat dog, collar, and leashes because that's already up here in my title. So I'm kind of creating a list. That, that's the sort of pattern that I'm using is creating a list. And I will do some more dog pictures just to vary it, make it different. All right, Ashley, what are we thinking? Uh, I was doing a little bit of a shortcut, just looking for some ideas so that I could play off of your, um, you were doing some really, well, actually I lost you, where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah, yours is looking great. You were creating some, some great UI for a desktop, so I was very quickly showing some mobile iterations. I was actually getting ready to create a mood board over here, but, mm, yeah. and um, so I found some examples that I was just trying to to update and I was gonna create a collar chooser, but still in process. I loved your gallery idea, like showing off your your doggy creations, but that's kind of where I am right now. Okay, I'm gonna come check out your mood board. I'm thinking, I'm working like- Still working on it. Okay, as cool as this could be, once we get it like nice and tightened up, you know, maybe you don't wanna just, you wanna quickly get to like your options. So I'm gonna try an interesting navigation over here on the right. Mm -hmm. um, and just create some categories. So we've got collars, leashes. Um, I don't know, maybe there's other things. There's certainly gotta be other things that, um, that we do. Maybe there's this cool feature which we do not have time to design, which I would really like to. I'm gonna call this like, 
AI Ooh. leash designer. I like that. Okay. And I really want to drive people to use this AI leash designer. So I'm going to make it like a different color than the other stuff. Maybe this is our store. All right. And do I need this background? Hmm. I don't know. The background like really sets it off and gives me like a whole navigation rail over here. So I could really have my like about uh, meet other owners, whatever it is that I want over here. But I want this AI leash designer to stand out. So what do you think? Uh, Audience, do we need this like other without kind of cleaner? This makes it more, draws the eye more over there. Interested what the audience thinks. Do we need that background fill? You think with? Mm, you don't agree with the placement. Melissa doesn't agree with the placement. So it's an odd place for the main navigation. I think Melissa's right, if that's what you're talking about. Um, what I would do as a designer is, rather than like saying, okay, I'm just gonna like change all this. and I'm gonna grab all this and duplicate it because I want a record of my work. Because I kind of like where this is going. I think this is interesting, but I think, Melissa, you have a point that that's not really where you would typically find your navigation. You would probably see it more right over here. So I'm going to create a quick thing. And make it go I think, I think I could do this all day, every day, Joshua. What do you think if we just switch to this style? We start doing this every day. <laughs> yep, I'm all about it. I'm just joking. All right, we gotta create space in between. Maybe these aren't big enough either, right? It's it's not quite dominant enough. So what I'm doing with the navigation is I'm quickly creating like some rhythm, whether, you know, rhythm all the way across, but then all of a sudden I've got this AI leash designer there's a couple of ways as a UI designer I might create contrast. Well, I made it a different color. That's one way to create contrast, to break the rhythm. What are other things that I could do? Well, I could make it bold. That draws the eye even more and creates contrast. I could make it bigger It's bigger, it's bolder, it's a different color. Too much, right? It, it's, it's just too much. I think, it, the, so what happened here? Why is it too much all of a sudden? I'm using three different ways to create contrast. Well, if I go back up to this idea, what I've kind of done is this. I've gone from one extreme to another extreme rather than having kind of a nicer gradual change, right? You don't need to hit it so hard. You can just create an easier thing. So I'm gonna back off and maybe I don't make it bolder. Maybe what I do is I create a background, a nice background. And this nice background will offset it what you know different from the other navigation without making it so different that it appears to be not part of the navigation. So I'm just gonna almost make it like a very subtle button. A little smaller.
maybe give it a nice blue. Let's go to the blues. Again, I don't really have like a strong color palette design, but just bluish gray, just barely. Okay, yeah. Needs tweaks, needs some love, but it does make it a little bit different, but it still is obviously part of the rhythm of the overall uh, navigation. Okay, I would love to keep going on this. Um, yes, this is great. <laughs> Aww. I'm still working on it, but... <laughs> yeah. These are great apps. Okay, this is so cool. Yet yeah, you've pulled in all these different elements and again, great scale, right? Because the dog is the dominant element. And then secondary, you've got this add to cart. Third, you've got the price. These are all contrast really nicely together. But yet they all stand alone, but they all work together. So I love these. <laughs> the hearts dang you're fast well i use community too so you did everything from scratch by hand so i did it, it all from scratch yep <laughs> you did everything <laughs> i can't take credit for that awesome okay thank, thank you it's really fun yes this is so good um we will send out the recording within three days. We'll send out, I will clean up the Figma board and send it out to you all and you can access it on the browser uh, and kind of look through all the examples and what we did here. But thank you all for joining us. Um, we do have an info session that we're about to jump over to. Um, the information session is useful for you if you are really interested in attending the Flatiron product design program or just want to learn more about it. Uh, I'm going to be walking you through what our program is, what product design is, talking about the industry, what kind of jobs you can get by going through our program. Uh, I'm going to post the information session link here in the chat. There you go. Oop, need to send it to everyone. There we go. Now, if you're interested in doing more of these with us, you can register for the next episode where we'll be with some other designers. The next episode is more about problem framing. It's less about the graphic design part of it and more about why changing words in problems can have a massive impact on how you go about solving those problems. We're gonna talk about different diagrams. If you're into like UX research, those kind of things, but even if you're a UI designer and you just wanna learn more about problem framing, definitely join us for that. It's gonna be a ton of fun. Um, so you can register for that on the Flatiron School website. Thank you all so much for coming and I really hope to see you again next month when we do episode two. Good night, everyone. Okay, thank you, see you soon. <laughs>